to introduce you to Cantor David S. Wisnia. He has a remarkable voice and he uses it to tell his remarkable story. A native of Warsaw, Poland, Cantor Wisnia is a linguist having mastered multiple languages, Polish, German, French, Slovak, English, and Hebrew, as well as Yiddish. He has performed internationally, leading services and giving concerts. In 2015, he sang to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz at an event attended by both survivors and heads of state, televised to, to an international audience of millions. Cantor Wisnia is a survivor of the notorious Auschwitz annihilation camp, where he was incarcerated for close to three years, saving his life by singing to entertain the Nazi, SS, and cell block leaders. What happened to him after that is nothing short of amazing. David S. Wisnia continued singing in the United States. He served as Cantor of Temple Shalom in Levittown, Pennsylvania for 28 years, and recently retired after 23 years as cantor for Har Sinai Hebrew Congregation of Trenton, New Jersey. Today, at 91 years old, Cantor Wisnia continues to be an active vocalist, educator, and congregational community leader. One Voice, Two Lives is Cantor Wisnia's memoir of his powerful life story, and he is here today to tell it to you in person. Ladies and gentlemen, you will remember this day for the rest of your lives. Please help me give a warm welcome to Cantor David Wisnia. Well, it's been beautiful. Thank you very much. How could I get a better reception? So, suppose I'm finished. <laughs> Well, you'll have to forgive me. Sorry to give, bring you a little bit of sad news in my family. Unfortunately, I have been married. I used to use a joke for the last 69 years. People don't do this anymore to the same woman. And about during that big storm last week, she had a heart attack, unfortunately, in the middle of the night. No lights, no phones. I could not revive her, and she passed on. It's unfortunate, but forgive me if I choke a little bit as I go on with the explanation. But I think you can understand it. Let's get to the good part of it. March 15th, believe it or not, which is tomorrow, I go the next day, 74 years ago. That's a lifetime. I think I have the figures correct, but you can correct me after that. And again, please forgive me for being a little jittery here. Seventy-two, nineteen forty-two. How many of you are good mathematicians? Most of you. So, how many years ago was that? March fifteenth, nineteen forty-two. I don't know if you can think that far back. 76. How many years? 70, yeah, I was close, I was close. Now, a little, a few months before, I arrived together with another 2,999 men, women, and children from a place called Nabitvor in Poland after Germany attacked 
Poland, and I must tell you, for the benefit of a little bit of history, and I don't know if you've learned that. Germany attacked Poland on August 31st at night, my birthday, believe it or not, and again, there was a dichotomy here because I kept on telling everybody that I was two years older. As a matter of fact, all my records show that I was two years, that I am two years older, and I never changed it. Why did I do a thing like this? When I arrived in Auschwitz, after being in the Warsaw Ghetto, I'm sure you've learned that, that's where we lived, and I was going to what was called gymnasium. Gymnasium in Polish was equivalent, I would say the equivalent of high school, college combination. Now please remember that I learned, if any of you might be complaining, trying to learn another language, well, every single subject that I learned for the first eight grades, believe it or not, including arithmetic, listen to this one, was in Polish and in Hebrew. And if you think the language is tough in Polish, it has no short words to rhyme, but that's another story. I learned every single subject in Polish and in Hebrew. And if you think a language is tough, learning, you know, uh, Spanish or any of the other languages, I had to learn every single thing in two languages. In addition to which, around the eighth grade, I learned German. But you know, I must tell you this before I even go any further. When you learn the language, not formally, what do you learn? The first thing you learn in a new language is dirty words, face it. <laughs> and you learn words. You don't learn sentences. You learn words. And that came in to haunt me when I became a American soldier during World War II, towards the end of the war. Well, anyway, let me get to the subject. That was the year 19... 42, when the war was over, of course, the Nazis attacked Poland, and Poland was not a little country. We lived in Warsaw, a population of about a million people, of whom about 25 to 30 percent, believe it or not, were the Jewish faith. And it was very easy for propaganda, as far as the Germans were concerned. And I do want to mention to you that, I'm rambling, I know, but you have to forgive me. It took the Nazi armies three days to occupy Poland, all of Poland, and that wasn't a little country. It took them another 30 days to take Warsaw, the big city, the capital of Poland. I was one of the kids, and I was only 13, really, 14 years old. I had already finished grade school and was going to what was called gymnasium, the gymnasium, high school, the equivalent of ages of most of you assembled here. 
I remember being taken out, all the kids even, went out to the perimeter of Warsaw to dig, you know, caves so that the German tanks would not be able to get into Warsaw. And believe it or not, it took them 30 days, three days to occupy all of Poland and 30 days to take Warsaw. Well, anyway, back to the story, something you do not learn, unfortunately. But it's history, and I think and believe that it is important that we know and remember. Together with another 2,999 men, women, and children, I arrived in what was called Auschwitz. I never heard of Auschwitz before. In Polish, Auschwitz is called Oświęcim. Now that will be, of course, important when I get into the song that I composed with the help of my baby grandson who is around here with me, Avi. And Avi, by the way, is a specialist. Let me give him a plug. Avi, Avi just graduated from the beautiful New York Music School and is a fabulous pianist and specialist of Bossa Nova, believe it or not, and speaks Portuguese. He went to Brazil to learn that. And he is the one who translated after 35 years of my trying in the United States to translate my song that I composed in Polish, into Polish, into, pardon me, from Polish, into English. You see, Polish is not a language, for any of you who have any background in Polish, that has very small, you know, words that rhyme, and that's what I compose. So it's quite a tough language. But anyway, back to the old story. I arrived in Auschwitz after losing my entire family in the Warsaw Ghetto at a massacre where the SS, in 1941, when they attacked Russia, and Germany attacked Russia in June of 1941, all hell broke loose in Warsaw, especially with the Jewish population in the ghetto. Everything was taken over by the SS. I still to date cannot understand how a most advanced culturally Germany, Germany was the flower of Europe really, educationally it was quite, quite known as the beautiful country of Europe that had some class. Unfortunately, the propaganda was such, and it was easy to pick on the Jewish population because they had nobody to defend them. Where every other ethnic group had their own countries, even though they were Poles, the Jewish population had no country of their own, and they had nobody to defend them. And they were easily to pick on because the Jewish population, Jews had learned, you know, with the Ten Commandments, not to kill, to learn. That's what the word Torah means. Scroll of the Old Testament that gave you a way of life. Unfortunately, let me get back to 
one Friday afternoon when my dad, who was a carpenter in Warsaw, befriended one of the Luftwaffe, which means Air Force, of the Germans that were stationed outside of Warsaw at the airport. He built some kind of a desk or whatever for one of the officers and a truck used to come in every couple of days to pick him up and bring him out to Okenche Airport. That Friday morning, unfortunately, my dad, either by premonition or whatever you can call it, asked me to replace him. Would I go and I'll be able to go shopping outside of the ghetto in Warsaw, and also I would be able to sort of go to the various stores outside of the ghetto in Warsaw. When I came back home, needless to bore you with the details, I could not get into my section, I was surrounded by the SS, and I found out later, of course, that my dad had a gun hidden somewhere and they found it on him, and my entire family, mom, 37 years old, father, 41, two brothers, I was the middle child, two and a half years older than I, one of them, and the other one two and a half years younger than I, all massacred. I became an orphan that particular day. I never went back into the house. All I found was a pile of bodies and recognized my mom's coat and sleeve until I finally uncovered most of the dead. So they killed the entire family. I was an orphan at that particular point. With the help of a righteous Christian who used to at one time work for my father I was taken out of Warsaw into a little suburb where eventually that one was liquidated and that's how I got to Auschwitz. Now once again, let me get with the beginning of Auschwitz because this you will never learn and for whatever reason you do not get details of. When I arrived at the railroad station in Auschwitz with the 3,000 people. Within minutes, I found myself among the 10%, and that was a huge percentage of men designated to be among the group to stay alive. Of course, we didn't know that at that particular point. But I realized there was something wrong because all the selectees were able-looking bodied young men. And all I heard in German was, Alle überachten zum Lager. I didn't know what in the world that Lager meant. The word Lager I never heard of in German. Lager meant camp. That was Auschwitz in 1942. When I arrived, 500 or close to it, 476 to be exact, were selected from that group of thousands. The men, women, and children went on trucks. We had no idea what, when, where and the 476 were selected to line up on the side in fives as the Germans were prone to do. And I, after hearing 
everybody over 18 into the camp, and I didn't know camp, but I realized that most of the people who were selected to the side were able-bodied, young-looking men. Not until the following morning, after getting into the camp and getting tattooed, we realized what happened. The rest of them were already dead. There was a little white house, that's the song I wrote about while in Auschwitz. And we did not find that out until, of course, the following morning, approximately, when some of the inmates told us, we asked, where are the women? Where are the children? They laughed at us. They says, did you hear that shooting? There was no guessing yet. They were just trying out in that little white house. We're talking now about 1942, around November or December. There was no Please bear in mind that my number is 83526. It still is visible on my forearm, on my left forearm, because when I came to the United States eventually, and I used to wear short sleeve shirts, and everybody kept on asking, what in the world is that number? I got tired of asking for mercy or asking for, you know, sympathy and told everybody it was my telephone number. Would you believe it? The majority of them believed that. It wasn't popular to talk about Holocaust. Okay, we're talking about 1942. The people who stayed alive for a while were the people who were selected and selected by the doctor who was at the train station moving people left and right, left and right, and I quickly finding out about that alle über 18, in other words, everybody over 18, I was only 16. I quickly remembered, I said to myself, August 31st, I might forget the date, but instead of saying that I was born in 1926, I very fast, when the doctor there standing, it wasn't even Mengele yet, if you know the name, if you heard, it was somebody before that. I said 1924. All my records show, including today, show that I was born in 1924. I never changed it. Not until years and years later, when my big son, what kind of a job is that for a Jewish kid? He's a rabbi, I believe it or not, in Princeton on quite one of the largest congregations now of about close to a thousand people in West Windsor. And he's the one who went with me back to Poland until we met somebody who knew that I was two years younger. Anyway, arriving in Auschwitz, it's something that you should learn how the procedure was. To the tune of a live orchestra, we were marched through what I call the Gate of Hell into Birkenau, which is a section of Auschwitz. That was the same gate, by the way, I was privileged to open a few years ago, I was given the keys when I visited Auschwitz again by 
Polish authorities as a memento of my time as a prisoner there. That Kodak moment, believe it or not, as witnessed by a Dr. Tulsamer Harjan, I don't know if you've heard of him, I think he worked somewhere in Trenton here, has been filmed and recorded for posterity. While in Birkenau, because I was such a strong-looking kid, I was selected for a horror job, which was carrying bodies from the ditch surrounding the electrified barbed wire fence. somebody who couldn't take it and found out that their family was dead used to very easily get into that ditch so that the guy, the watchman in the watchtower was able to shoot him. It's a very sad story, but a story that must be told because aside from having people who say this never happened, Really, somebody's imagination, it's a horrible imagination. I used to carry, that was my job for the first two weeks in Auschwitz. I would have never made it had I continued to do so. Around two weeks after doing this horror, My block älteste, which means the senior of the cell block, if any of you went to Auschwitz of seeing what these barracks looked like, I was told, or somebody yelled out, who can sing here in all this horror? Who can sing? Everybody knew Wismia sang. I was a soloist in one of the largest reformed temples in Warsaw. We had an 80-piece choir, and music was my life, really. Even though I learned opera, see, cantorial music at that time was quite akin to opera. And I learned Tosca, believe it or not, when I was Lucia van der Stelle's back aria when I was nine and a half years old. You see, Poland, unfortunately, had no middle class. Pre-war Poland. You were either well-to-do or you were poor. And poor, we mean the majority of the people were barely eking out a living. And that's exactly what happened. My dad, because he was a carpenter and supplied the little folding beds, upholstered folding beds, you know, to the big stores in Warsaw, was able to be among the upper class in that time. And that's why I went to a private school and learned all those languages. By the time I was finished, I was quite fluent and I subscribe still now to a Polish paper, a Hebrew paper, and of course this is without learning English. English, we learned words. And tell you, to tell you really something that happened that played quite a trick on me. I managed to survive Auschwitz where the longevity of the average prisoner was about a month. Not even that. 
because I used to entertain on occasion at the drunken brawls of the SS in Auschwitz, I got different rations and I managed to survive over two and a half years in Auschwitz. Birkenau. Now let me tell you, fast forward until 1944, November and December, if you can follow me. We begin hearing artillery fire. And if you know where Auschwitz is located in Poland, I would say south central Poland, close to the Slovak border, Czechoslovak border, and also closer to the Russian side, we knew that it had to be Russian artillery. I was selected on one of the transports in November of 1944. 1944, I said fast forward to 1944, with a group of close to 500 or 600 or maybe even more to march towards westward towards Germany because they tried to hide the atrocities that they performed really in Auschwitz. The gas chambers, I have copies here as a matter of fact of pictures of one of the crematoriums that was blown up in the gas chamber before the Nazis left. I was put on a marching death march, you've heard probably the stories of those death marches, into Dachau, Germany, that's near Munich. When I arrived in Dachau with the people after the march, quite a few hundred kilometers. It took quite a while. When we finally arrived there, we were told that, well, it's not even a question of being told. I realized that Dachau was unsurvivable for me, where I was a privileged prisoner in Birkenau in Auschwitz, no more privileges in Dachau, no place to sit, no place to sleep, no place to, because they took out all the prisoners from the eastern part of Poland, you follow from all the concentration camps, and took them into Germany. Now, Dachau at one time was a political prison, but when I got there, as I'm standing here, there was absolutely no place to move. And I hung around what was called the Schreibstube, which was the main office, praying and hoping that it would be a way to get out of Dachau. We're talking now about December, January, 1945. Please remember the war was not over until May 7th, 1945. Little kid Wisnia, at that particular point, about, what, 17 and a half, 18 years old, looks for a way to get out of Dachau. One morning I find a placard, an announcement that strong young men are looking, they're looking for young men who can carry 25 or whatever kilo of cement. They were building bunkers for their airplanes that were being bombed by the Western nations from one side 
and Russian planes from the other. And let me tell you, this played quite a trick on me. When we were marching out of Auschwitz, we were strafed by planes that attacked us. They didn't know, of course, that these were prisoners. That these were prisoners. But the SS attached themselves, you know, to our trains with trucks, with tanks, with all kinds of things going back towards Germany. Well, it did not work very well, and remember all these planes that attacked us had stars on them. And the stars, of course, were red. But who cared, as long as it wasn't a swastika or one of those, what do you call them, black crosses, as you've seen in World War II. This went on for a few days, and I got into that Schreibstube, to that office, and volunteered to go down south towards Austria, among about a hundred or so young men who volunteered to go, you know, to carry that cement to build the bunkers for the German airplane. Didn't work very well. I made an attempt to escape from that train as it stopped and been scraped at this moment now by Allied planes. And who in the world knew that the planes, uh, the Americans, also had stars? But there were white stars. But who cared, as long as it wasn't, as I said before, a swastika or a black cross of the Messerschmitts. On the second attempt, out of Dachau, going south on the train, I managed to hit one of the guards. The guards became older looking every minute of the day. And believe it or not, the young ones were taken away to the front because the mighty German army began losing the war. We're now talking about January 1945, the beginning of February 1945. I made my way, speaking German quite well. I'm not going to go into the details. I'll give a plug to my book that tells you how I escaped. And one find I managed to hide in barns, no compass, nowhere. Haven't got the slightest idea where I'm going but going towards the fire, towards the artillery fire. One fine, beautiful morning, I'm looking for a barn to hide during the day. I only walked at night. I hear a roar of tanks. Believe me, if I ever prayed before in my life, we're talking now about February 1945, the beginning of March, just as you see it now. I hear a roar of tanks. I look, I get up on the incline, not too far away from Munich, Germany, a town called Starnberg. I look down and I see a column of tanks, trucks, Red Cross wagons, all kinds of things going on a most beautiful highway. And if I ever prayed, as I told you before, I prayed. Never prayed like this. And the whole column, you think I'm important here, coming here, speaking to you? Well, 
let me tell you, I was very important because here a kid of about 18, 17 and a half, 18 and a half, a whole column stopped for me. I see that first white star out of the hatch crawls out, Captain James L. Walker from South Carolina. <laughs> Thanking God that it's not a swastika, we heard stories about some of the German DSS over at the Battle of the Bulge hid themselves in American uniforms, you know, with some of the uniforms that they captured from the 101st Airborne. And that's who it was. The 506 parachute infantry of the 101st Airborne coming down from Belgium down towards Frankfurt around that area. Out of that hatch crawls out Captain James L. Walker and I finally, I didn't trust this whole thing, walked over to him and says, you Russian? I thought it was Russian to me, a star was Russian. Who cared? White star, green star, yellow star, didn't make any difference. He says, no, no, American. I figured, uh-uh, I'm in trouble because this must be the SS, you know, that was hiding behind American uniforms. No, he says, I'm American. I look at him and remember my English was very halting before, as I told you, what language does one speak when you learn a language? He talked back. I never heard such English in my life. You know, you don't have that kind of English being learned or being taught in school. Wind up. I didn't trust him. And that whole column of tanks and trucks stopped. And I'm, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Tiananmen Square, remember where that guy was standing in front of the tanks, you know, holding up his arms for the uh, Reds who were, uh, what do you call it, occupying, uh, what was it, China. Wind up. He says to me, uh, what language? To me, and I says, well, I figured if he is American, as he said, he must have somebody who can speak Polish. It's got to be somebody who speaks Polish. He says, yeah, hold it, we got one. He yells down. I have a picture of Fred right here to show you. He just passed away, unfortunately. He yells out, Wilczek, Fred Wilczek from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Fred comes over to me and starts talking Polish. His Polish was worse than my English. <laughs> Could not understand a word. I still didn't trust him. <laughs> like I had to trust him. Anyway, I had a brainstorm again, and this takes place, by the way, they're going to make a movie of this. Finally, after the book just came out, I said to him, anybody Yiddish? Yiddish means Jewish, not Hebrew. I figured if he are, he's American, he's got to have somebody in the outfit. He said, yeah, we got one. Yells down, Harry Wiener, Harry Wiener from Arizona, California. Harry comes up driving up with a jeep, and there's this whole lineup of tanks alongside of that road. And little Wisney is standing in front trying to talk to him. 
Harry comes over to me and he starts talking Yiddish. My Yiddish isn't exactly good. I speak Hebrew, but I don't speak Yiddish. But I could understand what he said. He starts talking Yiddish. His Yiddish was even worse than the other guy's Polish. <laughs> Wind up. I became a part, this was my second life. The name of my book is One Voice, Two Lives. My second life began when I was adopted by the 506 Parachute Infantry, H Company, and became the formal, I learned English quite fast. I was put into a uniform because I spoke German. I started explaining, you know, or asking some of the to throw away their arms. Remember, the war was not over until May 7th, 1945. And you'll see my pictures over here in full uniform. They taught me how to use a Thompson machine gun. As a matter of fact, I just tried last year to show the guys over in Reading when they showed the reenaction of World War II. I tried to show them how to take apart a Thompson machine gun. I became quite proficient at it. I never left them until I came to Hoboken, New Jersey in January was it January, February, pardon me, February 1946. Now, I really now understand quite well when I see the Pope kissing the ground when he comes up a plane. Well, let me tell you, I kiss the ground of the United States. I am the best and biggest patriot you ever had in your life. I really appreciate what this country is all about and it hurts me when I see someone desecrating the flag and actually it, it hurts. I became the formal interpreter of the 101st Airborne, 506 Parachute Infantry. I'm given the honor every year at the gathering in Tampa at the Snowbird Reunion. This is the only year I did not go because I was not feeling too well and my daughter could not go with me. I built a family here of which I'm very, very proud of, and particularly the kid who is here with me, Abby, who is quite a musician, as I told you before, and we go around, believe it or not, give concerts. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to sing to you the translation of the song that he finally made into English. So, I will ask or give you the opportunity to ask questions. Let's see if I can find my song. You can help me, I appreciate it. Here's the song translated, or a close translation that no one else could do, that Abby did. Where are you? Are you around here? Back there. Somewhere, anyway. <laughs> I remember it so clearly, my days in Auschwitz. Got out alive just nearly, hey, he rhymes it too. And still the name it stings. Still I see that place 
Enduring like the scars I can't erase. Appel, Abstand, mitten up, that's German. Hear the sharp ears call. You wish you were never born at all. And here's the refrain. Auschwitzim. Through pain and sickness, always working Auschwitzim. With death behind you, always lurking Auschwitzim. Auschwitzim. Evil like some twisted dream. Never mind the hope of fame. Hunger is the only being Auschwitzim. Like numbers on my arm, it lingers Auschwitzim. I curse you with my broken fingers, Auschwitzim, Auschwitzim. Heart be hard as stone. Hatred is the greenest wheat you've grown. You see, it rhymes in Polish, and that's why I had lots of problems having this song translated into English. And believe me, I even had people who came from Australia could not do it. I'll be very happy, glad to answer any personal questions, anything at all, and I hopefully be able to answer. Thank you. I wrote a few words, really, about Birkenau that I would like to share with you. We were condemned to live in a cesspool where evil reigned supreme, where all religious, moral, cultural, social, judicial restraints on human behavior were ignored, or better still, they were never learned. The bonds that hold humans together into civilized entities were torn asunder and blatantly disregarded. When there are no legal or social sanctions against murder, life reverts to a jungle. And Birkenau was a jungle of such ferocity, ferocity I should say, that jungles in the wild would be ashamed to be associated with it if they could reason. The established system of prevailing wars of that jungle determined why a transport of a couple of thousand was reduced, hold on to your head, to six when the war was over and we left on the death march. There were only for my transports, six of us, and I was one of still, or am still one, who is alive to bear witness. I am given, really, as I told you, the most beautiful honor in Tampa, where I sing the national anthem. And the general who introduced me last year, I got the greatest kick. He gets up to the podium and he says, our own little Davy is going to sing the national anthem. I really gave me a medal. 
and it was beautiful. I would like to conclude, really, and wish that may no one who dwells in this great land of ours here, or people of goodwill anywhere, ever be subjected to a trauma such as you just learned me describe. Thank you for your attention, and go ahead, ask any question you would like. to Philadelphia, that's quite a few years back, and could not answer the question or did not want any sympathy from the people. Plastic surgery was not perfected in 1946. Please remember that for 47. What the surgeon did I couldn't sleep for close to a year because it kept on throbbing. You could still see where he stitched together. He did not fit a piece of skin in, you know what I mean? He cut it out and you could still see, you can still see now, the six, my last digit number, protruding on top. And the problem is that Plastic surgery then was not perfected and I couldn't sleep. It kept on pulling me, you know, over here. But it's gone. And now I wish I would have never taken it off. I hope I answered it. If you want to see it, anybody who would like to see it, by the way, I go back to Poland every couple of years. There's a group called the Reenactors of World War II. I have a picture of one of the Polish farm boys who are dressed in American uniforms. We did it last year. We created a stir in Warsaw. People came from all over. They thought America took over. <laughs> they were all in American uniforms. And I have their picture of it. Thank you, Gordon. Well, I've made friends with the director, Professor Tsubinsky, and unfortunately, there are not many of us left. Please remember, I am 91. I feel I'm strong, but I intend to live like Moses 120. <laughs> Yes. I beg your pardon? Companions from whom? You're talking about male? I am the only one that I know of because I was such a privileged prisoner. I have a picture of, hold on to your heads. I had a girlfriend. <laughs> How in the world does a guy have a girlfriend in Auschwitz? I was one of the very few who did. She is now, I found out about close to a year ago, in the United States. She is 98 years old. Last year she was still, I took my grandchildren to see her, and she went bananas, <laughs> really. Her name was Chippy. I have her name in the book as different because I didn't know she was alive, I found that out. And we went to see her, I took my grandchildren to see her in New York, 
she is not in good shape now. But let me tell you, I have a picture of her here. Now, she's bedridden, of course, and I hope and pray to God that she continues living. Avi saw her, and it's unbelievable. I took my granddaughter, and we were sitting at her bedside, and the first question she asked me in front of my grandchildren, did you tell your wife what you, we did? <laughs> I swear, you have Abby here, you heard it. And she looks at me, did you tell her what we did? I says, of course I did. The only question Abby just mentioned to me, I had one question for her. She was quite an important prisoner. She was one of the first female prisoners from Czechoslovakia. She's Slovak, or she's Czech, I should say, from Budapest. It's right near Budapest, somewhere around there, anyway. And it's very, very funny Avi, what did you ask me to uh, just <coughs> Oh yes, I had really one question for her. She was the one who designed, she was, a, she was eight years older than I. Little did I know what that was, but she taught me everything. She used to design the coloring. She was a, <coughs> what was her profession? She's a classic what? A graphic designer. And she was very, she worked in the main office of the SS and became quite, quite important to the <coughs> German authorities. And for whatever reason, I kept myself quite up with it. And I was not just a regular prisoner, you know, with the dirty clothes. I had lots of clothes. I worked in the Bekleidungskammer, where they had all the clothing. So I was in quite good shape. I said to her, I had one question. Simply tell me. How come 95% of the prisoners who were there, who came into Auschwitz, were always reshipped to a different place, to a different camp, and that's why so few survived? How come I was never taken out of Birkenau of, for two and a half years, all kinds of transports going all over, and I am the only one who was never moved anywhere. I always stayed in Auschwitz. She says, I in front of my grandson, she says, I saved your life five times. Like this. I says, you took my name off the list? My number? No name, number. She says, right, five times I saved your life. Incredible. Avi had to remind me of it. <laughs> because really I was curious to find out how in the world was it possible for me not to be moved anywhere. And being in that same place, everybody already knew me. Remember, I am an old, Auschwitz prisoner. There was nobody, even last year, there were only six of us left from my 83,000 serial number. No star, no triangle, no nothing, just the number. As a matter of fact, some of the assessment said to themselves, who does he know? How does he get, how is it possible he's still around, he's still alive? 
Okay. Any questions? Yes. Say that again. Yeah. I didn't write the book. The book was written by a professor uh, of Stockton University, including myself, of course, giving him all the details. A fellow by the name of Douglas Servi, C E R V I. He is my good Samaritan. And I see him as a matter of fact, I'm going to deliver a talk at Stockton next Friday, with God's help. Okay. Yes. Absolutely broke my heart. I was in that place about the week before. You see, I'm quite active. I'm sorry to tell you I'm a Republican. Let alone am I a Republican. I'm so far right. If I make a right turn, I'll wind up in the river. I learned the hard way. A bully only understands force. He mistakes niceness for weakness. So, I have learned, be proud of what you will have here. Unfortunately, most of our people do not appreciate what they've got. You've got to live in one of the horror countries in order to appreciate the United States, really. My children, I hope, of course, one of them is a burning Democrat, quite, quite a bit. But I sure hope that one of them, who just married his Japanese girlfriend, and lives, the poor kid lives in Maui, he just came in, he's staying at my home now, of course. Okay, just for a couple of days. Otherwise, when the bell rings, you're going to ninth period. 